Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a word from the Lord. We're glad you're with us to <clears throat> study God's word. This is the largest Bible class around. Uh, if you have a question, instead of raising your hand, just pick up the phone and give us a call, and we'll be glad to uh, uh, answer those questions. We're going to continue a, a discussion that I believe Caleb was going over. I didn't get to hear uh, a lot of Caleb's uh, lesson tonight, but I know we're going to be dealing with uh, some of the same issues. So, uh, what is uh, uh, what does the Bible say about uh, once saved, always saved, or what is the, what does uh, the Scriptures tell us about? Once being saved or and remaining saved, obtain, keeping your salvation and maintaining your salvation. But before we get into a lesson, we want to give you our content information. A word from the Lord at Jimmy dot com. A word from the Lord at Jimmy dot com. Two seven six three four zero two six five three is how you can reach me. And so, uh, if you uh, would like to study God's word, maybe you'd like to you know, have some uh, questions about something that we we're saying tonight, or you'd like to copy this program, just let me know. We'll be glad to study with you in any way, uh, shape we can. Uh, one of the things I want you to consider before we get into this lesson is just to show you how the devil operates. Now, friends and, and brethren, if you don't stop and think and pay attention that the devil is always going to try to keep individuals from fully understanding the will of God. And so anything he can do is going to uh, uh, disrupt or hinder our understanding God's will for us. In Matthew 4, verse 5 and 6, I mean, the devil, you all know, the devil quotes scripture. In Matthew 4, verses 5 and 6, uh, the Bible says that, that when Satan came to tempt Jesus, we know that he, he quoted scriptures to him. The Bible says, Then, then the devil uh, taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If thou were the Son of God, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up. Now, we all understand that the devil was actually quoting a scripture. He was, he was quoting a scripture, but that was not the correct meaning. It was not the correct uh, uh, interpretation, if you will. Now, when you hear people say, well, everybody's got their own interpretation. No, the Bible has one interpretation. And it's our job to get out of the Bible what God put in it. In other words, God had a meaning that he put in the Bible, and it's up to us to get that one meaning out. But if we're not careful, then what we do is we wind up resting the scriptures or twisting the scriptures because we don't understand what the Bible says in one place and that's going to cause us to, to uh, uh, misunderstand in another place. And so we have to find where it is written again and make sure they harmonize so that we don't run, run headlong into ourselves. So that we don't say, well, this is what the Bible says. And then all of a sudden we have a contradiction over here. And that gives us some confusion. And that's where people are today. When they don't understand one part of the Bible and they have made up their own doctrines, and then something else is brought up. Now, instead of uh, uh, giving up what they formerly believed as wrong and harmonizing it with what they now know is a new truth or more truth, instead they change the new truth to fit what they've already learned. And here's an example of this. When you talk about once saved, always saved, people will always, they seem to always... Uh, uh, not be willing to give up the idea that once saved, always saved is false. I mean, that, they, they, well, that's, it's got to be true. They're operating on the premise that once saved, always saved is true, so therefore anything that is contrary to that idea has to be made to fit this era of once saved, always saved. Instead of giving it up and saying, you know what, maybe once saved, always saved is not true, and I need to reevaluate what I've always believed. And so that's where we are. Now, here's a good example. This is, this is I just want to play you just a, a few seconds of a call that came in last week. And listen to what the, what the gentleman says and how it shows that when you don't understand one thing about the Bible, then you will mess up somewhere else. Listen to what he says. He's talking about being sinlessly perfect. You want to work from the Lord? Yeah, I'm guessing the reason everybody in your church is perfect is probably the reason nobody's there. 
Well, one re- one thing, I don't have a church. All right, number no, one. No, number one. No, 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 no. Yeah, you got to say your piece. I don't have a church. Number one, and number two. Sure. Everybody in the church that I'm a member of is not perfect, sinlessly perfect. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you're just standing there saying they are perfect. I didn't. You don't. I didn't don't say sinlessly perfect. Idolaters. I didn't say sinlessly perfect, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, I did sir. not say sinlessly perfect. It's See, it. the problem. The problem you have, sir, is you think that since you can't be sinlessly perfect, then you got to, you can be a vile sinner and still get to heaven. But the Bible clearly says. No, sir. That, no, sir. I, I I know I'm a sinner. I sin every day, just as you do. Okay, so what's your point? All right, now, <clears throat> the man is saying, well, you claim to be sinlessly perfect, but because you sin, if you sin, if you sin every day, then you're a, you're a sinner. And see, friends, here's the problem. When people take the, the wrong premise, when they start off on the wrong foot, then they're always going to come to the wrong conclusion. Friends, just because, just because you can say that you have your sins forgiven, that does not mean that you're sinlessly perfect. And just because you say, I'm perfect, doesn't mean that you're saying, I'm sinlessly perfect. Let me, let me ask you this. Ask yourself this question. If you sin, can you still be perfect? If you sin, can you still be perfect? Now, somebody's out there saying, well, no, you can't be perfect if you sin. Well, let's look at what the Bible says. In Romans chapter 3, Romans 3 and verse 23, we all this, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. See there, everybody sinned, James, so you know you can't be sinlessly perfect. No one's saying sinlessly perfect. See, that's what you're concluding. All right, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then in John chapter 1 and verse 8, John chapter, 1 John chapter 1 verse 8, if we say we have no sin, We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, here's what you have to understand. There is a harmony between sinning and perfection. You can sin. It is possible for a person to sin and a person to still be perfect. You saying, James? I, that's just you, you can't do that. You can't say that you're perfect if you're saying you have sin. Well, see, you're hearing me say sinlessly perfect, and I'm not saying that. I'm saying you can you can be perfect, and at the same time, you might sin. Here's how you do that. Just look at verse verse eight and nine again. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I'm not saying that we don't have sin, but here's the here's the harmony here. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, can we say that we're perfect if we're if our sins have been cleansed? See, when you have one false doctrine, I'm going to come back to this. But when you have one false doctrine, you start making God liar. You start making God a liar when you come to when you start taking a, a, a man's doctrine, an erroneous doctrine. You start making God a liar because God says that we can be perfect in Matthew chapter Matthew chapter five and verse forty eight. Look at what Jesus is saying. Jesus says, "Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect." Now, why is Jesus telling us to be perfect? If he knows we're going to sin. Well the answer is friends. Jesus is not saying be sinlessly perfect. He's saying be perfect. You are adding the sinlessly part. You are adding the sinless part. Jesus is saying be perfect. So the problem lies in the fact that when people say. Hear hear us say be perfect. Then you hear sinlessly perfect. No one ever said that. No one is ever no one's ever saying that we can be sinlessly perfect, that we can go through this life and not sin whatsoever. Paul said in Colossians 3, Colossians 3 in verse 28. Actually, I got the wrong verse up here, I do believe. Uh, 
it's uh, Colossians 1, sorry, verse 28. Paul says, Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Now, friends, I know that I'm in Christ. I have obeyed the gospel. I have done what the Bible says a person must do to be added to the body of Christ, which is his, which is his church, which is in Christ. Romans 12, verses 4 and 5. We are all one body in Christ. All right? I have, I have repented of my, I have believed in Jesus Christ, Son of God. I have repented of my sins. Luke 13, 3 and Acts 17, verse 30. I have confessed that Jesus Christ, Son of Man, Son of God, and that He uh, died for my sin. I believe that. And I have been baptized for the remission of my sins. And the Bible says that's when God added me to the church. Acts 2 verse 47. God washed away my sins. He took away my sins. He made me sinless and put me in Christ. Now, I have an obligation. I have an obligation to continue to be perfect or to strive to be perfect, complete in Christ. Not sinlessly perfect, but to be complete in Christ. So here's the harmony. Here's the harmony. When you say, when you say, well, uh, a person is a, a sinner, then they can't be perfect, and that's wrong. A person can be perfect, and at the same time, not be, not obtain perfection. All right. A person can can sin and still be perfect. Let me think about this way. You just pick your your favorite uh, uh, athlete or star, or whatever. Um, I don't I don't know anybody on the, I don't know the uh, Carolina Tar Heels team. I know they they just were national champions. All right. Now. Would you say they are a perfect team? Now I heard some talk on the radio. I listened to some talk radio and listened to sports radio. Uh, yesterday they were talking about the North Carolina Tar Heels, and one of the and the guys that was talking, he said, "Well, you know, there's a lot of different guys on this team that the opponents uh, just can't prepare for because everybody is is good at at some point. Everybody can be a threat." Now, friends, when I hear that, when I hear that there's a lot of, of, of threats, a lot of weapons on a team that uh, another team has to defend against, that tells me that's a pretty perfect team, a complete team. But I know they're not perfect because I, now I didn't keep up with it, but I'm pretty sure that North Carolina didn't go uh, uh, undefeated this year. Now, someone can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure they did not go undefeated. But they still won. Now, how is that possible? It's possible to be uh, to be defeated and still be a perfect team. It's possible to make some mistakes, but still be so complete that you are that you are good at what you do. And that's what a Christian is. A Christian is not sinlessly perfect, but yet he can be perfect in Christ. And that's where. Uh, John says in 1 John 8, verses, uh, 1 John 1, verses 8 and 9, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. That's right. We're going to have sin, but here's the thing. We can have perfection if we, if we confess our sins. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, let me ask you. If a child of God, if a child of God has had their sins washed away, are they sinless? Yes. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Now, what if we sin? What if we sin? Well, there's not really a what if because we're going to sin. John is going to go on to say, in chapter 2, he says, My little children, I write these things unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin. Well, what does he mean by that? It's, it's impossible to go through life without sinning. But it is the case that a person can be perfect, 
Even though they sin. How is that possible? How can you be perfect in Christ? You ask for forgiveness and God will cleanse you of those sins. And therefore, you can be perfect, completely Christ. It's not to say that you never will sin again. It's not to say that you can go through life without sinning. But it's to say that you can be complete because you're constantly asking for forgiveness of the times when you do sin. Now, when, if you don't understand that, if you don't understand that, then you're going to misunderstand a lot of things about the Bible because you're stuck up, you're stuck on this idea of sinless perfection. Friends, you can be, you can be a sinner and still have perfection in Christ. Now, let me ask you this. If you sin, does that automatically make you a sinner? Now, I believe this is another problem that people have. They think, well, if I, if I sin, then I'm a sinner. And that's what the man uh, that we just listened to said. He said, let's go back and listen to it again. Listen, he said, I sin every, I'm a sinner. I sin every day. Listen again to what he says. You're on the word from the Lord. Yeah, I'm guessing the reason everybody in your church is perfect is probably the reason nobody's there. Well, one re one thing, I don't have a church. All right, number no, one, no, no, number one, no, 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 no. You got to say your piece. I don't have a church. Number one, and number two, perfect. everybody in the church that I'm a member of is not perfect, sinlessly perfect. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you're just standing there saying they are perfect. I didn't. You don't. I didn't say sinlessly perfect. I didn't say sinlessly perfect, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, I did sir. not say sinlessly perfect. It's See, it's the it's problem, the problem you have, sir, is you think that since you can't be sinlessly perfect. Then you got to, you can be a vile sinner and still get to heaven, but the Bible clearly says. No sir, that, no sir. I, I I know I'm a sinner. I sin every day. Just like, all right. You hear him? He said, "I know I'm a sinner. I sin every day, friends." Now that may be true with him, but here's the thing. Here's what I'm saying. I may sin every day, but that does not make me a sinner. Now think with me. I wish someone would call in and tell me, just tell me what they do for a living. Just give me their occupation. And then I'm going to ask them, is that what they are? See now, let me give you let me let me put it this way. Friends, I've worked on my car before. I've I've changed things on my car, I've changed the brakes on my car, I've you know changed spark plugs and changed the oil and things like that. Now, if I work on my car, do those things like that, you might ask me, well, James, are you a mechanic? No. I am not a mechanic. I'll be the first one to tell you, I'm not a mechanic. There are some things mechanically I know how to do. I'm not a mechanic. That is not, that is not my livelihood. That is not what I do. But yet, I have done some mechanic work, but I'm not a mechanic. I've painted walls in my house. You know, I've painted different rooms in my house. I'm not a painter. Someone says, James, what do you do for a living? I'm not a painter. Oh, but I thought you I thought you said you just painted this room. I, I did. I'm not a painter, though. I can do some carpenter work. But you know what? I'm not a carpenter. See, there's a lot of things you might do that does not make you that thing. All right? Other day, it was pouring down the rain. You know what I did? I ran to my car. Now, if someone says, well, James, are you a runner? No, I'm not a runner. I'm not one of these guys that gets out here and runs, you know, five miles every day. No, I'm not a runner. But I can run. See? Now, someone says, well, do you sin? Yeah, I sin. I sin. But I'm not a sinner. In other words, that is not my practice. Look what Paul says in Romans 6 and verse 12. Romans 6 starting in verse 12. And this is what, this friends, this is what I'm trying to say. This is where people misunderstand and because they misunderstand this, then they get off on what they've always said because they can't get over the fact that, well, I sin and then they say, well, I'm a sinner but I know that God's going to save me so therefore, once they've always said, no, 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 see? Because you don't understand one thing, you're going to jump to another conclusion here. Look what Paul says. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, and you shall obey the lust thereof. If sin is not reigning in your mortal body, 
You don't obey it. Now, does that mean that you don't sin? Does that mean that you're not drawn away after your own lust and enticed? And when lust is uh, uh, conceived, it brings forth sin, James 1, 13 through 15. Does that mean just because you've... Uh, uh, you're in Christ now. Does that mean that you don't have any sin, no, no uh, uh, sinful desires? No, it's not what that means at all. It just means it doesn't reign in your body. Neither yield yourselves members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. In other words, your body does not become a tool for unrighteousness, but yield yourselves unto God uh, as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of uh, righteousness unto God. Now look at verse 14. He says, For sin shall have no more dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now, wait a minute. You mean to tell me that if sin doesn't have dominion over you, you can still sin? See, friends, this is what we're talking about. It is possible for you to sin and yet for sin not to have dominion over you. It's possible for, for you to sin but not be a sinner. Paul says, what then? Shall we uh, sin because we are not under the law? Now he just got through saying, he just got through saying that, you are, that sin does not have dominion over you and then in the next verse he says, Shall we sin? You mean it's possible to sin, Paul? Yeah, it's possible to sin. But you don't sin so that grace may abound. Galatians, I'm assuming me, Romans 6, verse 1 and 2. He says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Now notice the difference. You can, you can sin. It's possible that you will be entangled in a sin, but yet you're not a servant of the sin. Because the perfect person in Christ is not going to yield themselves to be the servants of sin. The person who has obeyed from the heart a form of doctrine, the form of doctrine that was delivered to you, that is the gospel, is not going to be a servant of sin. But they're going to sin. As long as you're in this flesh that, does, that has desires, then you're going to sin. You're just not yielding yourself to it. You're not giving yourself over to it. It's not reigning. It's not ruling. It's not having dominion over you. Don't you see a difference? So just like I can work on my car and not be a mechanic, so it is that I may sin from time to time, but it's not raining in my life, and therefore, I'm not a sinner. Because if I am perfect in Christ, not sinlessly perfect, but if I'm perfect in Christ, I'm going to ask for forgiveness when I sin, so that the blood of Christ continually cleanses me. See, friends, here's the, here's the problem. When you say, well, you're, you're a vile sinner, what you're saying is you're claiming to have been washed in the blood but yet you're such a vile sinner that the blood doesn't take care of your sin. And that's the problem that you have with born in sin. People say, well, you're born in sin, you inherited Adam's sin, sinful nature. Well, the cure is the blood of Christ. You mean to tell me that it can't take care of the, of the plague? The curse? It can't take care of sin. See, when you start off with one false premise, then you start negating what the Bible says about the blood of Christ, being able to cleanse you of your sins. Because you say, well, I'm born in sin, and the blood of Christ can be applied to me, but I'm still a sinner. Well, friends, that may, you may think that way, but I'm not that way. I wasn't born in sin. I chose to sin. And at one point in my life, sin had dominion over me. But then I said, you know what? I'm going to yield myself a servant of God. Sin's not going to have any more dominion over me. When I, and therefore, I'm no longer a servant of sin. Now, I may sin from time to time, but because I am perfect in Christ, I'm going to 
continue asking for forgiveness of sins and let the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse me of all sin and I can still be righteous. I can be righteous and just in the sight of God. So just because a person sins does not make them a sinner. They're a sinner if they yield themselves to serving sin. Now, if you don't understand that, then you, can, you might conclude, well, since I can't be sinlessly perfect, but I know God promised salvation, therefore it must be once saved, always saved. See how it is? You don't understand how a person, how the Bible says a person can sin and not be a sinner, or how a person can sin and still be perfect. So you make up another doctrine that comes along and says, well, God must overlook all these sins because I'm, I'm a sinner. I sin every day, therefore I'm a vile sinner. I just, I'm, I'm filthy rags, I'm unrighteous, therefore you know, God's going to have to overlook all that because I know he promised that he's going to give me a, a, a home in heaven. See, it's just, it just like that when you rest the scriptures, you should start turning to all kinds of knots. You know, it's like when you go to untie your shoe and it's all tangled up a little bit and you give it a good uh, hard jerk on your shoe nut, laces and all of a sudden it's going to make a bigger knot. All you did is make it worse because you didn't understand what the Bible said the first time about salvation. So you might think once saved, always saved because, because you don't understand how it's possible to be perfect even though you might sin. So you're thinking sinlessly perfect. You're thinking, well, uh, uh, it's impossible not to sin, so God's grace is going to cover everything. I'm just going to keep sinning. And that's the problem that people have. Here's, here's another example. Here's another example. Here's Jerry Carter, Dr. Jerry Carter here at Regional Baptist Church. And this is what he says about someone who is a sinner, who is entangled in sin. And say he gives him a pass. Listen. Well, sorry about that. Let's see if it go now. All right, my dog. May have to pass on that one. I got a short in my cable here. Try one more time. In this, in this video I'm trying to play, I uh, asked Jerry about a man sinning, an adult committing adultery, and he says, well, I don't know that a saved man would do that. Well, why not? Any other individual comes along and says, well, I'm saved, I'm saved. And people say, well, I'm, I'm a vile sinner, but they'll still say they're saved. So why is it then that a saved man couldn't commit adultery? And it's because they don't, they, they're looking for sinless perfection. They're looking to be sinlessly perfect. And so they say, well, I don't think a, a, a saved man would do that, but all the other people that don't commit adultery, they still say they're saved, and yet they'll admit that they're vile sinners. So then how, is it, how is it possible? How is it possible for that to take place? And he gives a whole list of things there that, that can't separate us from the things of God. Okay, so in, in, along those lines, let me ask you this then. <clears throat> so you're saying a child of God, a child of God uh, is, is saved. They're, they're not going to be lost, never going to be lost, never fall. Uh, 
What no, is I didn't it? say they weren't going to fall because they okay. real backslide. Right, they're not going to be lost. They're not, they're not going to be in, in, condemned to hell. Right. Okay. So if if someone who is saved then goes and commits fornication and dies in the very act, are they going to be in heaven? Well, would a saved man do that? Well, I believe so. I don't know if a saved man honestly would do that. I mean, you know, would a saved well, man go out here and commit adultery? Would a saved well, man go out here and commit adultery? Would a saved well, man go out here and commit adultery? Well, let's ask it this way then. Would a saved man go out here and steal? Would a saved man lie? Would a saved man uh, cheat? Would a saved man get drunk? You just named the sin. You just named the sin that you commit, Jerry. You go ahead and name a sin, or anybody else, name a sin that you've committed today, and I'm going to have to say, well, you're not saved then, because a saved man wouldn't do that. He said, oh, y'all know I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. I'm just a, I'm just a, I'm just a sinner. I sin every day. Well, wait a minute. Would a saved man sin every day? See how it works? Because you don't understand how a person can be saved from their sin, have their sins forgiven, sins washed away, sins remitted, and still be right with God even though they may sin. Now, friends. The problem that we're people having is they don't understand how God forgives sins to start with. And then, because they don't understand that, now they get to the point that say, well, I don't think a saved man commit adultery. David was a man after God's own heart, and he sinned. He committed adultery. See that? So you know it is possible for a person to commit adultery even though they may be saved. Now here's the here's the difference. Here's the difference. When someone yields themselves to it, like Caleb was talking about Tim Whitehart, for a year, I would say he's he's reigning, he's letting sin reign his life. He's yielding his members as servants of sin. See that? Now, can a person sin? Yes, a person can sin. James says a man is is a sins. When he is uh, drawn away of his own lust, he's tempted when he is uh, drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. The difference is a person that may sin, a person may sin, but yet say, I'm not letting this reign in my life. This is, this is not going to continue. And the result is they can ask for forgiveness. But because people don't understand that, they say, well, they either conclude that I can sin, I'm a sinner every day, sinner every day, because I can't be sinlessly perfect, or they'll turn around and say, well, I don't think a saved man would do that. Either way, it shows they don't understand God's law of forgiveness. And so they come up with this idea of, well, I think... I think once you're saved, you're always going to be saved. You, you just can't lose your salvation. Once, once you've gotten rid of all these vile sins, even though you continue being a sinner, God won't just throw you away. Well, listen to what the Bible says about it. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Now, this is one of those problems that people have. They hear Jesus say, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. And so then they conclude, hey, can't lose it. See, just like, just like they hear someone say, well, that's don't sin that grace may abound. Well, grace is going to cover all the sin. No, friends, you're missing it. You're missing it. Jesus said he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. But does that mean what you think it means? You know, you keep saying once saved, always saved. I, you keep saying that. I don't think that means what you think it means. Listen. Ask yourself this question. Can a, can a person fall from grace? 
True or false? A person cannot fall from grace. A person cannot lose their salvation. You know what, friends? If you think that a person cannot fall to the point of so sin that they're lost, if you think a person cannot lose their salvation, you need to think again. You need to understand the Bible because the Bible does not teach that a person can sin, even be overtaken in a sin. I'm not talking about sin once and ask for forgiveness. I'm talking about be overtaken in a sin. I'm talking about uh, commit sin, commit adultery for a year and still maintain a proper relationship with God to the point that they are going to maintain or retain the hope of salvation. Here's what Jesus said. He that hath, he that believes in me hath everlasting life. You need to understand what hath means. Some of say, well, hath means that you hold it and you, you, you've you got it. It's permanently secured. No, friends, hath just means you, that you have something. It doesn't mean that you can't lose it. Here's what you have. In, in connection with eternal life. See, this is another verse. If you think that Jesus is saying you cannot lose your salvation in John chapter 6, in verse 47, you need to listen to what Paul says in Titus 1 and verse 2. And it will shed some light on, uh, on what Jesus said. First, uh, excuse me, Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. Paul says, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. What did God promise? Eternal life? No, he promised the hope of eternal life. In hope of eternal life, which God promised before the world began. In other words, God said, I'm going to provide eternal life. But man has only the hope of eternal life, because if they yield themselves servants unto sin, if they yield themselves as instruments of unrighteousness, if they continue to sin, guess what? They don't have the hope of eternal life. If the Bible says that no, no sinner, if the Bible says that Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like shall not inherit the kingdom uh, uh, of God. If they will not inherit the kingdom of God, how can a person be engaged in those things? In other words, continually commit those things and still have a hope of eternal life. So you've got the Bible contradict itself. But no, the Bible's clear. You have the hope of eternal life if you're not continually yielding yourselves instruments of unrighteousness. You can be freed from sin, cleansed from your sins by being obedient to the gospel. And if you sin, you ask for forgiveness and God will continue to cleanse you. But if you engage in yielding yourselves servants of unrighteousness and engaging in these uh, sinful activities, Paul will say, walking in them, notice this, let's look at Colossians 3, verse 5. He says, mortify therefore your members, that is to put, put them to death, which are uh, upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, uh, Inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetous, which is idolatry. For which things saith the wrath of God come upon the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. If you're living in these things, friends, you can't convince me that you're, you can live in these things and maintain a hope of eternal life. You just can't do it. So the hope of eternal life is what we're talking about here. Uh, Titus 3 and verse 7. Titus 3 and verse 7. 
Being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now friends, do you see how the, uh, how the Bible is very consistent and clear? A person can be, have forgiveness of sins by being baptized for the remission of their sins. Then, if they sin, they can ask for forgiveness and God will continue to cleanse them of those sins. But an individual that continues living in these sins will lose that hope of eternal life. There is going to be no eternal life, no entrance to the kingdom of heaven to those individuals that will live in the sin of the world. So you got individuals on one hand saying, well, we can't be sinfully perfect, but God's going to cover all these sins. And then you have some, well, if a person is doing all these sins, I don't think they're really saved. Well, which is it? See? Which is it? You're confused on both ends because you're missing what God is saying. A person who is yielding themselves uh, service of unrighteousness doesn't have a hope of eternal life. So when Jesus says he has eternal life, he's talking about individuals who will continue in his word and not continuing in sin. Now notice, now notice the contrast here. A person who continually engages in sin does not have a hope of eternal life. But a person who will have a hope of eternal life, look what he engages in. John 10, 28 and 29. I give, unto the, I, gave, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Now someone reads that and they says, Well, <clears throat> see that? They, they were given eternal life. They'll never perish. No one can pluck them out of God's hand. But friends, you can pluck yourself out of God's hand. You can remove yourself from the hope of eternal life, which is what we're talking about here. A person that continues to <clears throat> uh, engage or goes back into the world, let's look at this. 2 Peter 2 and verse 20. If after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You mean their escape? That's right. Sins are washed away. They're gone. Now watch this. They are again entangled therein and overcome uh, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. So they have escaped the pollution of the world but yet now they're entangled again therein. And the latter end is worse than the beginning. Friends, how is it if you, are, if you are a sinner, but yet you're saved by the grace of God, but you're still a vile sinner, sin every day, therefore you're a sinner, sinner, sinner. How is it that you can be entangled in those sins and have the end better than the beginning? See what we're talking about? Individuals who don't understand... Uh, the doctrine of salvation, who will say once saved, all, born in sin, and once saved, always saved. They have it just backwards. They say their beginning is better than their end. They were born in sin, tangled in sin, but yet we're, we're already in heaven. Because I'm saved by grace. No. The Bible says you're worse than the beginning. How is that possible? Unless there's a greater condemnation for those individuals who have learned the truth and then go back and start committing sin. Yield themselves members of unrighteousness. Alright? So you can, you can sin. You can lose your salvation, the hope of salvation. <clears throat> you can take yourself out. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible is constantly emphasizing maintaining or abiding in the word as opposed to abiding in sin. 
Luke five, uh, Luke eight fifteen. This is the parable of the of the sower. But they on the good ground are they which, in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Now think about that, friends. We're talking about keeping the word of God as opposed to keeping the sin. We're talking about continuing in the word of God as opposed to continuing in sin. John 8 verse 31 Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him If ye continue in my word then are ye my disciples indeed. Once saved always saved <clears throat> is false because Jesus puts a condition on keeping or continuing in his word. Do you mean to tell me someone who is saved who obtains salvation from their sins and then is given the hope of eternal life when this life is over. You mean to tell me that they are going to maintain that hope of eternal life even though they don't continue in the Word and they go back and continue in the world? How can a person continue in the world and make it to heaven? When Jesus says the only way you're going to be saved are if you continue in His Word. See the difference? The difference is, what do you continue in? What are you doing? Your salvation depends upon you continuing to do uh, what God instructs, all right? Continuing in His Word. Now, someone says, well, well, when does a person lose their salvation? Well, they lose the hope of their salvation. When they sin and fail to repent of it. Because that's the beginning of yielding themselves members of unrighteousness. That's when they become entangled again in the pollution of this world. Now, can they retain the hope of their salvation if they, if they repent of their sins? If they repent of their sins. I find it amazing. Everybody wants to say, well, once saved, always saved, but then they'll turn around and stress, well, you've got to repent. Friends, that's what we're trying to tell you. You won't get any argument from us when you say, well, the Bible says you've got to repent. That's exactly right. But what if you don't repent? What if you don't repent? Once saved, always saved says you, it doesn't really matter if you repent or not. Once saved, always saved says you can do whatever you want to, be unrepentant, and you can still get to heaven. And that's just, that's the devil's lie. That's the devil's lie. That's why the Bible is full of admonitions to continue. To continue. Look at this, Acts 14, 22. Confirming the souls of the disciple and exhorting them to continue in the faith. And that we must through much tribulation enter to the kingdom of God. But you've got to continue in the faith. Now here's another doctrine that people want to throw up and they say, well, this, this is foreign to the Bible. Work salvation. Friends, what do you think continuing in the faith is? You see how, how the devil gets individuals so twisted up? They say, we're well, born in sin and you can't be saved unless God does something for you. And you're a vile sinner, right? You're a vile sinner so you, you can't really be righteous in God's eyes. You can't be sinlessly perfect. Therefore, God has to accept you and forgive you and let His grace cover all these sins. And even though you're so caught up in sin and you're living a sinful life, He's going to take you to heaven because once saved, always saved. And you can't do anything to change it because that's worth salvation. The further down you go with man-made doctrine like born in sin and once saved, always saved and the impossibility of, of apostasy or impossibility of falling, it just digs the hole deeper and deeper, friends. You've got to continue in the Word, continue in the faith. Here's again, Colossians 1.23. If we continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. What's the hope? The hope of eternal life is what the gospel talks about. Which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, where I, Paul, made a minister. Continue in the faith, grounded and settled. 
What if you stop? What if you don't continue? Well, your neighbors that believe one saved, always saved. This verse might as well just cut it out. Paul must not know what he's talking about. But no, the Bible continues to say continuing in the faith, continuing in the gospel. Why? Because that is what is uh, maintains your relationship with God. That's what helps you maintain that relationship so that you can ask for forgiveness of sin and let the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. 1 John 2, verse 24. Let, uh, let, therefore, let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. Now friends, this is not work salvation. This is faith salvation. Faith that works is dead. Faith is what keeps you continuing in the Word, abiding in the Word, making sure that you're walking in the light as He's in the light, maintaining a fellowship with Him so that you can continue asking for forgiveness of sins. Well, once saved, always saved as far into the Scripture. As far into the Scripture. Verse 28, 1 John 2, 28, And now, little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. Can you abide in Christ while at the same time abiding in the Word? Can you continue in the gospel while at the same time continuing walking in the lust of the flesh and yielding yourselves members to it? Can you continue walking in the word, abiding in the word while you are abiding in the world? Impossible. Impossible. And so the way to maintain your salvation or obtain salvation is you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 8, 24. If you believe not that I'm healed, die in your sins. You repent of your sins. Acts 17, verse 30. God commands all men everywhere to repent. Confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Acts 8, 36 and 37. And then be baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2, 38. Acts 22, 16. Why tearest thou? Rise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So, now you're added to the Lord's body. Now you've got to continue. You've got to continue walking, abiding, heeding the word, not being tangled again in the world, or you'll lose your salvation. You, you'll lose the hope of salvation that God has given. Look at uh, 2 John in verse 9. We're running out of time here. 2 John. Don't ask me what chapter. 2 John verse 9. Look what the Bible says. He says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. Friends, you can't abide in Christ. You cannot abide in the doctrine of Christ and at the same time abide in the world. So when we say a person can be perfect, we're saying they continue to abide in the doctrine of Christ. They continue to abide in the Word. They continue to live their life according to these principles. And that would include asking for forgiveness of sins, repenting of their, of their sins, and God will forgive them their sins. Not sinlessly perfect, but yet they are perfect in Christ. Not entangled in the world, but walking in the Word. See that? Now, when you stop walking, when you stop walking, that's when you walk in darkness. That's when you fall. That's when you lose that hope of salvation. So, here's the thing. Salvation has two sides. It has God's side and man's side. And God is faithful to keep His Word. That is, He'll provide eternal life to those who are faithful unto death. He's faithful to keep his promise if man is faithful to keep his word. You have to be faithful to God. I have to be faithful to God 
in order to obtain the hope of salvation, hope of eternal life, when this life is over. So, can a man lose his salvation? Yes. If we let go, if we stop walking, we stop heeding his word, rendering obedience to his word, we'll fall. Yeah, once saved, always saves the devil's life. You let go, you let go of the word, you stop listening to it, stop heeding it, you'll fall. Friends, I hope this has helped. We're out of time. I hope this has helped. If you have any questions, I hope you will uh, call me. Let me know any way that I can assist you. Here's how you can reach me. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. 276-340-2653. Till next time, friends, always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Have a good night.